All right, howdy. Welcome everyone for joining us for this virtual artist talk today featuring five artists in the show Territory, the exhibition in a box on view at the Wright Gallery through March 11th, 2021. My name is Rebecca Pugh and I will moderate the virtual artist talk today. I'm the curator at the Wright Gallery and also a lecturer in the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M University. Today there will be a 15, 10 to 15 minute Q&A session at the end of the talk with questions submitted by students in advance. First, I will take time to describe the Wright Gallery for our guests located in the UK. The Wright Gallery is located in the College of Architecture at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. College Station is located within a triangle of three large cities, Dallas, Austin, and Houston. The College of Architecture has four departments, including the Department of Architecture, Construction Science, Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning, and the Department of Visualization. The Wright Gallery is located on the second floor of the Langford Architecture Center's Building A. The gallery's 2008 renovation was made possible by a generous gift from James Wright, a retired senior partner with Page Sutherland Page, an architectural firm, who earned a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Texas A&M in 1954 and his wife Mary. You can see the Wright Gallery on the right-hand side of this image here, taken from this atrium in the center of the Lankford Architecture Building, you can see the Wright Gallery with Territory and the Exhibition in a Box. The Wright Gallery is pleased to give Territory and the Exhibition in a Box its US debut following shows in Berlin, Scotland, England, and Romania. I will now provide a brief tour of the exhibition going clockwise through the gallery. Territory and the Exhibition in a Box is a print portfolio project devised by the Created and Contested Territories Research Group supported by Norwich University of the Arts in the UK. This curatorial project includes 10 collections of 18 limited edition prints housed in yellow clamshell portfolio boxes sent to international venues selected on account of their resonances with issues of territory. Here you can see the yellow clamshell portfolio box in the exhibition along with the specially commissioned essay by Dr. Nicholas P. Maffey of Norwich University of the Arts. In the exhibition essay, Dr. Maffey describes that the works address relationships of power across boundaries of class, gender, religion, race, species, and nation, as well as crossing lines of subjectivity and desire. Each work is contextualized within the essay and within artist statements provided by each artist. These artists respond to complex ideas surrounding territory, in different ways. Some referencing geography, politics, and history. Many of the artists that we'll talk today reference history within their work. Most prints deal with text. Some incorporate text alone. Some incorporate text with image. Artists such as Carl Schubert, Doug Fishbone, and Millie Thompson also use humor in their works. Abstraction is used within some of the works, exploring the commodification of land and sea Neil Boosfield's landscape value cable route references an aerial view of a proposed cable route for an offshore wind farm. Artist Jesse Brennan's abstract monoprint titled Picket Line is a graphite rubbing of a sidewalk pavement underneath a picket line defending pensions at University College London in 2008. 19 UK-based artists are featured in this exhibition. This virtual artist talk will include five artists and professors at Norwich University of the Arts. Neil Powell, Juliana Gavril, Desmond Brett, Carl Rowe, and Magda, Magda Storsky Bevan. Our first speaker will be Neil Powell. He is Emeritus Professor in Art and Design Education and former Pro Vice Chancellor Academic at Norwich University of the Arts and the first champion of the Created and Contested Territories Research Group. Well, first of all, uh, we'd like to say hello and thank you to Texas A&M University. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with, with you guys. And uh, we also send our best, best wishes to uh, friends and colleagues in Texas. And we know it's been a very difficult time for you recently. And I, I know that on Friday we had issues in terms of people getting into the university, et cetera. So what we do appreciate the strenuous efforts you've gone to to host us at uh, such a, a difficult time. So I am Professor Neil Powell. I'm an ambassador for the UNESCO City of Creativity Fondazione Pistoletto in uh, Biele in Italy and Emeritus Professor 
Norwich University of the Arts in UK. Uh, this is a kind of overview introduction to Territory, the Exhibition in a Box, which I've subtitled Thinking Outside the Box. Uh, we eventually ended up back in a box, but uh, we, we had to get there somehow. And I'd like to start with a quote by Ivan Vladimirovich Cheklov, uh, a passage from his formulary for a new urbanism, uh, which was a major influence on the Situationist International Movement. And you, forgotten, your memories ravaged by all the consternations of two hemispheres, stranded in the red cellars of Palikau, without music and without geography, no longer setting out for the hacienda, where the wine is finished off with fables from an old almanac, that's all over. You'll never see the hacienda, it doesn't exist. The hacienda must be built. This will reference might become clarified as we go through. To express our motivation in another way, uh, the New York Times interviewer asked of the explorer George Mallory in 1923, why do you want to climb Everest? And Mallory responded by saying, because it's there. Well, similarly, an art critic interviewing the artist John Cage in 1974 asked, why do you want to make art? And Cage responded famously, because it's not. And I think this perhaps gives an insight in what we were trying to do. We were starting ab initio with not very much except a few ideas and some conversations. So the background to the work in the box is that the Created and Contested Territories Research Group formed in 2016 at Norwich University of the Arts on the eastern seaboard of the UK. You'll see a small map there. We are on the extreme right, about 30 minutes from Amsterdam, so quite close to mainland Europe. And these exchanges took place by email and in person uh, and became unified as the, the name and the theme Created and Contested Territories as being a common research interest. So we met face to face and online to focus our exchanges and agree a license or mandate that would enable us to orchestrate our diverse individual disciplines and practices and to respond creatively and collectively to our theme. So words become incredibly important forging common ground and these are the territories agreed by the group of what started out of, uh, as 27 diverse researchers but it narrowed down to 17 and then 18 uh, and continues to be in a minor state of flux as people joined uh, and then uh, left and rejoined. But these were the words that we felt were germane and inclusive, and we, we've gone back to these, as you'll see later. But I'm not, I don't intend to read the whole lot out, but sovereignty, political borders, crossing points, disputed territory, private land, enclaves, migration, biological or zoological areas, animal hunting ground, plant and fungal growth, insect colonies, invasive species, natural habitats, artificial propagation, and so on. And I will say that these words weren't kind of just uh, rattled off or were agreed in 10 minutes. They were actually hard won uh, through days of discussion, weeks of exchange, presentations, critiques. Uh, and so it was an extremely challenged set of terms that we used. And that was important, I think, in forging a kind of consensus. So, so far, so good in principle. We had the theme, we had the words, but how to apply, apply these in practice. And in my next slide, you'll see our problem in that the group of researchers were extremely diverse. Uh, this isn't everybody. We have also had a writer. So, yeah, we had a, a one side. But this is our map. We use this map to kind of plot where we were in relation to each other because we all were coming at this theme from different angles in terms of our practices, production, media, if you like. So the animators coming from one end, the filmmakers from another, visual effects from another, physicists completely differently, uh, a librarian asking, how do I fit into this? Uh, you know, from an arch archival point of view. So we, we actually didn't really understand, I don't think, the difficulty of understanding those cognate distances uh, in terms of collaborative research. So uh, that's where we started off by realising that although we had arrived at a hard one set of uh, words in accordance with the theme, we didn't know what we were going to do. The first real research question was how to collaborate. How do you collaborate across disciplines? The first research question, identify and demonstrate a working method for herding cats. So very, very difficult, quite a boisterous group uh, full of characters, extremely clever people uh, and uh, very intense discussions, arguments, vetoes and consensus was developed over a period of time. And we were meeting at this time, I think, twice a month in person, as well as all the email exchanges in between. So we set on an approach which was based on the classic Hegelian dialectical approach. 
So hypothesis, thesis, uh, uh, antithesis and synthesis. Stage one hypothesis was to test the feasibility of doing this as an inter interdisciplinary uh, group to be productive uh, and could we address and interpret this complex theme? And we did actually try things out. So we did have discourses, we made visual presentations to the group, we presented artifacts and objects, artworks, other books, written essays to provoke reasoned, we hope it was reasoned argument and debate. And the milestone for us in this stage of the research was that if stage one proved feasible, we would then move to stage two, thesis. So if we could mobilize a consensus to produce a unified critique of dominant narratives and products, uh, could we do this whilst remaining genuinely interdisciplinary? I.e., would people have to abandon their disciplines or move to other disciplines in order to take part? And given that the majority or at least half the group had no um, experience of creating physical objects or artifacts, this was quite an interesting point. So, we have theoreticians, uh, theorists, historians, writers whose medium was the written word. So to suggest uh, they might concretize their thoughts in a different way was quite a challenge in terms of their past experience. So we, we carried on with the visual presentations. And if this proved viable, then we would move to antithesis uh, to challenge the credibility and viability of what we uh, proposed or tested as a consensus approach in stages one and two. The antithesis, of course, is quite difficult when you're trying to drive a project forward. You have to actively consider the possibility of not being able to do it. So you might not be able to agree uh, on, on the output. You might not be able to agree on the vehicle, uh, whether this should be an exhibition, symposium, publication, et cetera. So, you know, we, we vacillated a lot between the options for doing this. And we also had to challenge the transfer, tra transferability of possible vehicles for dissemination beyond the immediate local academic context, i.e. were we just creating a local interest research uh, that had no validity or interest for anybody else? So was it a transferable object or transferable idea? And managing the unmanageable by thinking the unthinkable became something of a, an epithet for us. Uh, and we did have to embrace the idea that non-viability and dis disintegration of the group were possible and at times seemed probable uh, during the quite heated discussions. But they were seen as having to be permissible outcomes, even after post stage three uh, and as we got towards synthesis. So we hammered out all these details uh, of this, it, along with the, you know, the dialectical model, which made us feel very worthy and clever and learned and kind of professorial, I guess, but it didn't really solve the problem of what we were going to do. And then came the rather shocking realization that as a group, we are or were mainly practitioners, not theorists. So we went back to the beginning, we rebooted, we went back to the beginning, the words, the theme, the ideas, the thing that initially attracted us to the idea of territory, and to the idea of working as a group to res conduct research and share research on territory. So back to the words, back to the mandate, if you like. And we argued, I think once we'd made this realization with renewed vigor and purpose about contested locations and venues, <clears throat> and came across the following, uh, we, we came, uh, we resolved, I suppose, the following in our four lightning meetings, it should have an eye in there. Museums, galleries, embassies, libraries, prisons, and other permissible uh, uh, venues we thought might be suitable as contested territories. To give you an idea of the, the kind of conversations we were having, this was just an extract from actually some of the people that are here today and one or two that are not. Uh, and there was pages of this where everybody proposed different contested sites and territories. Uh, we started off by not insisting on their viability uh, but it, it soon occurred that you know areas such as the democratic republic of congo afghanistan syria ukraine uh, uh, etc were really quite problematic from a personal safety perspective so we we had to uh, be selective about this and what was what what was the level of risk we were prepared to encounter uh, so uh, uh, yes here we are and that was just an example of how we shared information and we then went over these in person, some made it to the final cut, but the majority didn't. 
we simultaneously discussed about how we might address the theme in such venues. So it was a joint discussion, dual discussion about the venues and about the contents we might author. Conference papers, exhibitions, symposia, interventions, installations, happening performance, films, t-shirts were all seen as being a fairly definitive, acceptable list. Uh, and we were still managing the unmanageable. The group wasn't without controversy or challenge. Uh, indeed, it thrived on it. Uh, and uh, I think, that, you know, within the portfolio itself, there are some quite uh, challenging works. But it didn't collapse. It took us a while to turn the theory into practice. It took us some months. But eventually we agreed a vehicle, a box. Why a box? A boxed edition was, we felt, able to contain our megalomaniac ambitions and it tempered our thoughts by combining sustainability with maximum reach and, of course, pragmatism. As John Baldessari said, it's difficult to put a painting in the mailbox. Curators will all empathise with that comment, I'm sure. And it also built an expertise within the group. In 2017, Carl Rowe, Professor Carl Rowe, uh, originated this box, uh, and I think I wrote the frontis for it which was about ballot, it was entitled ballot, it was about voting, it was about democracy. Uh, uh, and it, it, in its format, it laid the seeds of what uh, territory was to become later. But in terms of the format, this is Hannah Darboven, Dar which is her world theatre. So it, uh, within this box, there's a whole range of different theatrical uh, possibilities and sets. So it's actually a very uh, mundane type of box, but the, the contents are extremely kind of challenging and interesting. You have box with the sound of its own making, so a three and a half hour recording of this box being made, uh, playing back its own construction. You have, uh, and this was a major source of inspiration for me as a, a kind of um, a follower of concrete poetry, conceptual art, and this was an extremely um, uh, important publication at the time, extremely impractical, of course. It had vinyl records, cassette tapes, all kinds of things in the various uh, numbers of Aspen, the exhibition in the box, the magazine in the box rather, um, and uh, a fascinating collection of stuff, which is all now available online at ubu.com if you can't afford the $25,000 to buy a set. But it was an extremely important moment and uh, some very important artists, artists were part of this. Um, as you'll be able to see, I think uh, John Cale, Velvet Underground, through to Ian Hamilton Finley, uh, yeah people too numerous to mention. So the box is a format. Similarly, Christian Boltanski, uh, the photographic album of, Con of Christian Boltanski, and uh, Joseph Cornell, of course, famous boxers. So that gives you some kind of idea of the context. Um, I'll leave you with my own work, which I'm not going to narrate too much because I think it's kind of, you'll hear more from colleagues about their work, but I think, um, as John Baldessari again said, art is in things, it's not in things, it is in the air. And I think, uh, as much as we write down what the box was about, it was also about the dynamics of the conversation and the strange chemistry that existed between the surviving researchers who managed to forge an agreement as to what to do. In the end, the Hacienda was built. Uh, I think there were 17 artists plus one print uh, and an addition of 10. And the whole idea of simultaneity was important as well in that um, the boxes are out there in the world in different places and they remain in those places because they're contributed to the collections of Nottingham Contemporary Art Museum, uh, Lust and the Apple in uh, Edinburgh and uh, CLB in Berlin and now of course uh, Wright Gallery. So uh, that's it from me. I'm now going to exit my screen. Thank you very much Professor Powell. At this time I would like to introduce Dr. Gavril. She is a senior lecturer in architecture, cultural context coordinator, on the BA architecture course and created and contested territory research group champion. My contribution to the territory of the exhibition in a box stemmed from a first hand encounter with a building complex that Michel Foucault described as other spaces or heterotopia. My talk will therefore dwell into issue, issues of spatial otherness and it is dotted with reminiscence from and questions raised during my architectural education, which I trust the audience will find informative. As a second year student, as a second year architecture student, I traveled, 
I traveled to the northwest part of Romania for a study trip to the picturesque region of Maramureș, northeast of the Carpathian Mountains, and stayed in Sighetu Marmație for one week. As a cultural region, Maramureș straddles Romania and Ukraine. It is commonly sense, uh, said that one third of the region is located in Romania and two thirds in Western Ukraine. This is a, a kind of contested territory, contested area, because throughout its history has been shared by many countries. Maramureș has much to offer to architecture students interested in vernacular wood architecture. The main objective of the study trip was to survey wooden buildings from local churches in use to dwellings in the open air village museum in Sighetu Marmație, which as a regional ethnographic museum opened in 1981 which meant in the last decade of a communist regime of Nicolae Ceaușescu. And you can see pictures taken by a younger self. So please don't be too critical with the, with the images, with my photography skills when I was a student. The wooden dwellings coming in the format of complete households were mostly displaced from the Romanian side of Maramureș. The museum also curated one household from Ukraine in addition to one from Hungary and two Jewish houses, one of which accommodated a village synagogue. The campaign for collecting artifacts, service buildings for life in the countryside or the entire architectural structure started in 1972. The reason for the creation of the regional open air museum is multidimensional and it is beyond the scope of a presented, uh, present paper to be further explored. For the sake of, uh, of this talk, it is enough to note that during the intense period of building Romanian socialists, many people were encouraged to leave the, the region and their days and houses to take up jobs in the fast emerging socialist cities centered on heavy industry and dwell in workers' apartments. The dwellings in the village uh, museum, despite not being it habitable, work to an architecture student, arguably an alternative to the socialist architecture madly driven by the political regime. In other words, the households in the village or the formally and socially other. It was, however, the prison museum in Sighetu Marmatie that instigated more questions about spatial otherness than the village museum. The prison museum is currently part of a memorial to the victims of communism and resistance in Romania and was established post-revolution in 1993. The museum building dates back to 1897 and was designed as a prison to cater for criminals, offenders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was the Second World War when the area became part of Romania that the prison was an entry point for the repatriation of Romanian war prisoners and deportees to the Soviet Union. As early as 1948, the prison became a political one that is reserved to any opponents of a communist government, be them students, pupils, or peasants from the Maramureș region. The communist re uh, government with its armed wing, the Securitate, run the place for detention of the class enemies in the 50s. Those class enemies were interwar Romanians, political, religious, military, and academic elite. In the extermination prison, about 54 over 200 prisoners perished, and they were mostly aged between 60 and 93. The most prominent of those was the former prime minister, Yuli Maniu, who died in the prison in 1953. In 1955, uh, some of the survivors were released, while others were transferred to different prisons and camps in Romania. Another important date in the life of the building was when it became a warehouse for seasonal goods in 19, 1975, 
1993, when it became a, um, uh, being an insalubrious ruin, was given to the civil society by the town hall. Visiting the prison museum made me think about spatial otherness from the perspective of ideology. The prison was the institution that Michel Foucault condemned in his study titled Discipline and Punishment, The Birth of Prison, for the insidious control and policing of the body. Yet, in the early address to the architects and subsequently published text of other spaces, Utopias and Heterotopias, Foucault had a neutral tone towards prisons and even saw some merit in their existence as other spaces. Foucault claimed that heterotopic spaces grant us insight into our condition since it breaks with the banality of everyday existence. As a student, I struggled to reconcile Foucault's conflicting views. While the panopticon structure is missing from the Siget to Marmati prison, hence the body is not policed while in detention, in the detention the body is fully controlled. The elongated internal atrium lit naturally only on the short side, the enfilades of prison cells, the narrowness of cells within the symmetric de de deployment of architectural elements, shouted control, coercion, and injustice. But this perception was that of a visitor of a museum, not of someone incarcerated there or the prison guards or the people working in the prison. It became apparent to me that it was the museum as the other space and not the prison that granted me insight into our condition and allowed me to create the print for the territory, the exhibition in, in a box, which works with uh, very simple elements, very much inspired by the symmetry of a, of, a, of a building layout, and tries to do justice to, to, to the motto of the institution, of a museum, as part of a memorial institution. When justice cannot be a form of memory, memory alone can be a form of justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gambrell. At this time, I would like to introduce Senior Lecturer in Fine Art Sculpture and Subject Leader in MA Fine Art at Norwich University of the Arts, Desmond Brett. The piece I made for the Territories exhibition was the word Doggerland set in fractal font in field gray as worn by the Wehrmacht during World War II, set against a background of field gray from the contemporary German Bundeswehr. This presentation considers how two geographically separated locations of East Anglia in England and the Greater Berlin area are connected through the actions of both non-human and human intervention. In this context, territory is examined in relation to what the 18th century geologist James Hutton described as deep time and through to more recent histories of actions, interventions, migrations and movements. The influence of the shared lithographical composition specific to East Anglia and in particular the counties of Suffolk and Norfolk and Berlin will be explored with specific examples based upon a form of psychogeological fieldwork that informs this project. The typical geology of East Anglia, especially the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk, is mainly comprised of marine sediments and estuarine sands, gravels and fine silts of Pleistocene age from 2.5 million years to 11,700 years old overlain by a thick layer of fluvial glacial clays and chalk nodules, as well as abundant erratics, which are pieces of material that are not local country rock. They were deposited by the southern migration of glaciers of Nordic origin. Some further overlaying deposits containing assemblages of deer, reptiles and sharks have even yielded evidence of early humans. Much of this material was deposited in a proto river Thames, which itself was a tributary of the river Rhine. The geology of the Berlin metropolitan area is of Pleistocene age, leaving a morphological phenomenology defined by advancing and melting ice masses. Three major glaciations originating from the Nordic region define Berlin's topography of gravels, tills, erratics and sand at such thicknesses that unexploded World War II ordnance is still recovered, sunk into the soft sediment, and the heavy load test structure proved the heft of Speer's proposed triumphal arch of Germania 
would be incompatible. Extending the consideration of material movement, the example of East Anglian flint is appropriate as it is generally interpreted as being far traveled, but sourced locally. It populates the shorelines of East Anglia as it is easily washed out of the soft cliffs in deposits formed as the ice sheets scoured, transported and dumped material on their journey south and retreat north. Flint's toughness was identified by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who employed its razor sharpness when struck and flaked into weapons and tools for killing and preparing prey. As I walked the Norfolk coastline among the pebbles, the microlith or Mesolithic hunting tool was easily distinguished from the rounded shingle deposited by the tide. My eye had been alerted to its symmetry and it sat between my fingers and thumb with a satisfying ease. The top had a distinctive V-notch that probably served as an end scraper and the length was a tapered triangle. Each edge had a distinct and neat retouching to enable scraping ending at a tapered tip for piercing prey. Although the image you're seeing here is the, 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 the microlith, it was slightly sea-worn, so its sharpness was slightly blunted. Doggerland. Located at the eastern extreme of Britain, the East Anglian coast is in relatively close proximity to mainland Europe, and it is entirely reasonable that the earliest hominin migration would have arrived here from continental Europe across Doggerland, the land bridge that connected what is now Britain with the Dutch coast and the western coast of Germany. It was near the location of my own discovery that in 2001, at the storm eroded cliff base, a 700,000 year old piece of shaped flint made by a distant hunter gatherer uh, and an ancestor of Neanderthals was found providing evidence of the arrival of the first early humans from Northern Europe via Doggerland and indicating that tools were manufactured 200,000 years earlier than had been previously assumed to be the earliest humans. Gradual warming of the climate and isostatic adjustments caused by the retreating ice sheets made sea levels to rise forcing the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer inhabitants to migrate out of the inundation as Doggerland slid into oblivion around 6,000 years ago to make Britain an island. Professor Vincent Gaffney of Bradford University's Lost Frontiers project, attempting to understand the Doggerlanders' move from hunter-gatherers to farming cultures, states, without wishing to engage too vigorously in the current debate, Doggerland is a cautionary tale. It may also be significant that as a time when political boundaries are being redrawn, to remember that the loss of Doggerland was not an abstract event. A very real catastrophe, Doggerland's fate is perhaps a, perhaps a prescient indicator of the current climate of change. There is evidence to suggest that the drowning of Doggerland led to the development of sedentism and territoriality, as Mesolithic peoples clung onto the disappearing landmass and its precious resources and fertile hunting ter terrain as seas rose. Those who want to leave Europe cling to an outmoded and redundant myth of the island nation, separate and independent, with the votes cast for Brexit propelled by the dangerous right-wing rhetoric of immigration. East Anglia's proximity to mainland Europe made it strategically important during the Second World War, basing aircraft to deliver the Allied air war over Germany. The abundance of easily accessible sand and gravel deposits, including a, a large quantity of flint, supplied the aggregate to make concrete for the runways that were dotted around East Anglia and constructed to support bomber squadrons. East Anglia was also significant for the deployment of service personnel in the region to construct the runways which were undertaken by United States Army Air Force Aviation Engineering Battalions using the locally sourced estuarine and glacial aggregates. These were segregated units of African-American personnel who were generally not integrated into flying units, but worked in support roles. Although the United States Army Air Force maintained segregation on base, according to the 8th in the East Anglia project, and I quote, generally GIs of color were welcomed by the local communities and many friendships were formed. As a result, the African-American men of the 8th Air Force, when off base, experienced life without segregation, end quote. It is interesting to consider imported glacial material that, although lo occurring locally and originating from elsewhere, was extracted, graded, sorted, and redeposited into an aggregate by men who were themselves extracted, separated, relocated, and redeployed within the larger body of the Air Force. Personnel who were born out of forced migration to America and largely living under segregation and racism in 1940s America were then sent to Britain under the same auspices. It asks the question of what or who really belongs. Berlin's Teufelsberg is an artificial hill and the site of an abandoned American surveillance installation called Field Station Berlin, 
built and operated by the Americans and British to monitor the movements of military and, and civilians in the East during the Cold War. After the Berlin Wall came down, the station was abandoned and gradually fell into disrepair, leaving tattered graffiti encrusted structures. This is the site of a never completed military college designed by Albert Speer, the remains of which are entombed beneath the rubble hill of Humenberg, otherwise known as Devil's Mountain, comprised of an estimated 26 million cubic meters of rubble heaped from the pulverized remains of Berlin, ravaged by the Allied air war during World War II. The landform continued to be piled up into the early 1970s to a height of about 120 meters, making it the highest point in Greater Berlin. In Buried City, unearthing Teufelsberg, Benedict Anderson describes the Teufelsberg Hill as a burial chamber, not just of a shattered city, but also society's national psyche, that it, and I quote, contains absence and loss in the millions of fragments of the former city. The idea of Teufelsberg being a burial chamber could have its antecedents in the Hugelgraber of the Bronze Age, making the location of this modern tumulus overlooking the Grunewald Forest, especially apt in relation to the mythology of the Teutoburg Forest or the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich. The Devil's Mountain represents the extraordinary rebuilding of Germany post 1945, which could also be understood in the context of W.G. Sebald's conception of, and I quote, self-anesthesia. The difficulty of addressing such devastation during Germany's post-war efforts to forget, it is impossible or, or possible to see the act of piling a hill from the outside in as the burial of all that represented the catastrophe of political failure in the unsorted spoil of the Teufelsberg. I visited Teufelsberg to undertake my own field trip to gain a better understanding of what this site stands for. Walking from Grunewald S-Bahn station, the white balls of the radomes peek out above the thick willow plantations. The desire lines of paths trodden through the trees, ascending up the slope, make me think of Teufelsberg as a place of pilgrimage, like a Krogpatrick for ruin lust devotees. At the summit, the wire mesh fence showed evidence of multiple breaches from years of breaking in with a well-worn path forming a circuit around the perimeter that took me to the entrance. Once abandoned as a surveillance post and after plans for transforming it into a casino and a transcendental meditation center failed, Teufelsberg stands as a ruin that wears an ever-changing, sticker-bombed, slap-tagged and graffitied camouflage. From my elevated vantage point, inside the highest radome, I could admire the Grunewald to the south, Vernon March's Olympia Stadium, built for the 1936 Summer Olympics to the north, the Corbusier House of 1957 nearby, and the Fernsturm winking in the sunlight over Berlin. Standing upon such an elevated position, I thought about Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, surveying the sublime landscape stretching into the distance. Perhaps this is not so far-fetched considering the artificial peak I was standing on, like the picturesque scenes from Romanticism, is a construct. It occurred to me that we could read the remains of the old field station as a site to look out from within, a kind of ruined panopticon with which to comprehend the past underneath the present around us. Yet descending Teufelsberg's summit, the ground reveals itself it's, to me. Its remains emerge. As my eyes became attuned to their presence, the emergent debris of approximately 16,000 buildings can be seen littered amongst the leaf matter and earth. Moss-thick chunks of concrete and shards of crockery can be found underfoot like Anthropocene fossils exposed in a scree slope to remind us of the terrible origins of their being. The fragments of loss were being unearthed and found again. Maurice Blanchot writes about the fragment as something that and I quote, can never be reassembled in any future presence whatsoever, end quote. The debris mountain of Teufelsberg is an assembly of fragments and remains that cannot be reconstituted into their former identities. Teufelsberg is not fixed, but a leaching, eroding mass that over time will become denuded and its suspended fragments washed out to resettle. The mound I walk on is only a temporary lithological structure, its composition held in check for the geological moment. These shattered remains and pieces of ground matter propelled me to think of Robert Smithson, describing the spaces of demolition in his home, that is Passaic, that needed filling as, and I quote, the monumental vacancies that define, without trying, the memory traces of an abandoned set of futures, end quote. Here, underneath my feet, lie a million remnants and stories of pasts without futures and lives that became atomized in the bombing of Berlin. The rubble continually emerging from the earth at Teufelsberg will keep reminding us that it really happened. The post-glacial Pleistocene deposits that begat the runways, which deployed the aircraft, that delivered the bombs, that destroyed the city, that had to rebuild itself, transport rubble, that became aggregated into new landforms, including Teufelsberg, that overlaid the footings of Speer's intent, becoming a symbol of territoriality, 
and a subsequent site of post-89 obsolescence. It is the Pleistocene deposits that supported the Grunewald Forest of Mythology and the Mesolithic tool that washed out at my feet. It is also the Pleistocene ice advance that enabled Doggerland to emerge in the ice's final retreat, the final finally washed it away and disconnected Britain from Europe. Amid the rhetoric aiming at taking back control, that's a quote, over borders and immigration that permeated the pro-Brexit campaign of 2016, Boris Johnson even referred to Doggerland in his appeal for British unity. And this is another part of his quote. For those who wanted to make Britain less insular, the answer is not to submit forever to the EU legal border, but to think about how we can undo the physical separation that took place at the end of the Ice Age. Indeed, Britain and Holland used to be joined in the, in the old days by a territory known as Doggerland, though the customs of Doggerland are no lost to his history. End of quote. There is something strangely pertinent about Doggerland's disappearance, driven by retreating ice and rising sea levels, precipitating the disconnection from Britain and Europe as the last Brexit. End quote. In the context of such deep time thinking, the writer Robert McFarland asks, and I quote, what does human behavior matter when Homo sapiens will have disappeared from the earth in the blink of a geological eye? End quote. Having slid towards this new break amid the chaos of deliberation, de deferment and misinformation propelled in no small part by xenophobia, we might consider how territory is demarcated, exchanged and coveted, that it is something fugitive, abstract, yet physical, to be continuously fought and argued over, but never really possessed. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor and Fine Art Course Leader at Norwich University of the Arts, Carl Rowe. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, Yes, and I think I should point out, first of all, that uh, that the impetus for this piece of work um, sort of came from two sources, one from uh, conversations that I had with my father from his uh, memories of, a, of being a child and also uh, a, a fortuitous moment when on holiday in Mallorca, I um, took a photograph of a Colorado beetle and the Colorado beetle is, uh, it, you know, for the reasons that my father was fascinated, they are infamous and they do cause terrible crop damage. Um, and I sort of couldn't quite believe my luck when I saw it. So I, that's my photograph on the right hand side and on the left hand side, uh, a document that my father had kept um, as a young boy. So it's a sort of biographical, autobiographical, as well as um, a, a work around the art of entomological warfare. So I'm going to start off with a quote. Uh, this is from the United Nations report from 1969. And the report was entitled Chemical and Bacteriological Weapons and the Effects of Their Possible Use. Uh, in the course of spread, the Colorado beetle first lives in small foci, which grow and increase until it becomes established over large territories. The beetle is capable of astonishing propagation. The progeny of a single beetle may amount to about 8,000 million in one and a half years. So my father's uh, schoolboy fascination for natural history was practiced in a macabre manner. Throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s, he feverishly collected insects, dispatching them in a jar before pinning them neatly into cigar cases, accompanied by handwritten annotations, much as the Victorian collector would have done half a century before. An equal obsession of his, as a boy living through, the, uh, through World War II, was to collect shrapnel and fragments of crashed military aircraft from around his family home in the south of England. He built his collections of insects, and war detritus until in 1943, he was blown off his bicycle by a bomb, at which point he discarded his shrapnel and concentrated on natural history. As his collection grew, one outstanding obsession was to find a Colorado beetle. His attraction to the particular beetle was in fact, was in part due to its vilification, an insect outlawed as an enemy of, uh, as an agent of enemy forces, supposedly weaponized and deployed with the purposes of destroying potato crops. The screen printed artwork crop is a visual reference to the weaponization and, myth and mythology of the Colorado beetle. It depicts a color photograph of the beetle feeding on green leaves, marked or targeted by a violent cross slash of reddish pink. The cross is suggestive of destruction or disease, an object targeted for eradication, or the red cross painted on the doors of families blighted by plague. Ar around the photograph printed in bold orange text are the words armor, the armor of the beetle or the armor of in insecticide or military hardware or propaganda. Rotation, 
of crops and the cycle, uh, life cycle of the people or revolution or sovereign boundaries. Ration, the implied impact of infestation upon human food supplies, uh, but also the catastrophic consequences of losing the world's invertebrates. And at the top, Ami Kaffer, which is a conjunction of two German words, Amerikanische, meaning American, and Kaffer, meaning beetle. By using the word Ami Kaffer, the work crop is unambiguously referencing the Cold War and specifically the friction between German communism and American capitalism. Crop could also refer to cropping something, cutting to size, checking, or governing growth. The Colorado beetle's Latin name, Desamlineata, is a reference to the 10 stripes that the insect has on its wing cases, but one could easily think of the Roman military capital punishment of decimation. Crop deals with the territory of a single beetle, an organism capable of astonishing proliferation and subsequent catastrophic damage, but also of a home territory, the Rocky Mountains, where it rightfully belongs and contributes to the stability of an ecosystem. The Colorado beetle does not in itself pose a threat in the manner of a pandemic, a blight or zootoxic attack. It does not come near to the existential threat of sustained conventional weaponry or nuclear bombing. In the territory of conflict, the Colorado beetle represents the potential for an insidious retroaction, a friction, a psychological regression, diminishing optimism, grinding, deflating and demoralizing. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are the accumulative effects that bring about defeat. It is the mythology, the ramped up fear and subconscious terror that such agents of destabilization embody. Terrorism inevitably leads to a confused state of all beings and all objects. In the word crop, the beetle is both adversary and victim. Adversary of the crop, uh, uh, of the crop and the farmers cultivating it, and victim of the farmers who, turn, who lured it from its natural habitat and now use pesticides to eradicate it. The plants that it's feeding upon are both casualty and assailant, casualty of the beetle's voracious appetite and assailant as they evade and invade agricultural land. We could equally consider the impact of the beetle's natural food source, the prickly nightshade, which according to the Global Companion of Weeds is an agricultural weed, casual alien, environmental weed, naturalized, noxious weed. Farmers are recommended to use herbicides such as dicamba, triclopia and glossophate to check the spread of this plant. And what of the insecticides intended to control or eradicate the beetle pests from the crops? Organophosphate insecticides, of which the most commonly used are malathion, parathion, diazinon, and ethion, do not recognize pests from allies. They kill everything. An article published in Nature in January 2019 by Nico Eisenhower, Aleta Bonn, and Carlos Aguera, which attends to the pressing issue of increasingly in, of an increasingly likely in, invertebrate extinction, extinction states that most animal pollinators are insects, e.g. bees, flies, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles and thrips. And bees are the most important pollinator group, visiting around 90% of leading global crop types. According to a recent article published in the Guardian newspaper, more than 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. Organophosphates are unobtainable by the public, but carbonates and pyrethroids are readily available and can be bought in bewildering quantities from DIY home stores, or at least they can in the UK, I don't know about the States. An earlier idea for crop, using the words carbonates, crop, pyrethroids and sins, uh, we, have more, we have more sense about our, our energy consumption and recycling on a domestic level than we do our damage to invertebrates in our homes and gardens, our domestic territory. Crop is an image that deals head on with the invasion of a territory, an insect pest on vegetation, but it quickly becomes more complex, an image that forces us to question the intersections of who or what the enemy is. Crop is a visual metaphor that embodies the territories of conflict, the theater of eradication and the corrosion of fear and suspicion. Crop allegorizes systematic and calculated eradication. The conjecture that surrounds the history of weaponizing the Colorado beetle sums up the mythologizing and misinformation of conflict. In Crop, we question whether the Colorado beetle is the weapon or the target. Upon a more critical investigation of the subject, we can clearly identify allies and enemies in what reveals itself at the intersection of histories, territories, and agencies. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Rao. All right, so our last speaker today for the virtual artist talk is multidisciplinary artist Magda Storsky Bevan, who works with sound, moving object, and print. Um, my print for the territory portfolio, Orinenberg Strasse, was a starting point of research of void in relation to communities that vanished from cities across Europe. How to hear the influence of languages which are no longer spoken. How to convey meaning of architectural details which have lost their original function but are the only evidence of one's vibrant communities. Can avoid caused by genocide be filled by family memories or is the stranger who through aimless wandering reactivates the lost rituals and ceremonies of every day. This has been natural progression from my previous investigation into hidden narratives within the city structure, but also new challenge of conveying the notion of void in contemporary sound installation. I'm drawn to liminal places, threshold and feelings, feeling of being suspended in between. Uh, this is a, a larger version of Renenberg Strasse uh, presented in Invisible Narratives uh, exhibition at Newlin Art Gallery in Cornwall, um, curated by Professor Lubaina Himit in 2018. Uh, the scale is important in my work. This piece is uh, 1 meter 35 by 2 meters across, so that's 4 foot 5 inches by 6, uh, and seven, six feet uh, 7 inches. The image has um, two barriers, the actual wooden uh, ornated door uh, and the imposing metal gate to protect the building. And by cutting the metal gate, I'm hoping to open possibilities for discussion. The absent raining becomes a negative space, a void. The Boulevard Anfa presented in the same show uh, depicts another metal gate at the same time uh, in Casablanca. The dead bamboo leaves, which were painted later to bring them back to life, pushed against the gate to obscure the view of an abandoned French colonial villa. The bright color painting over the paint printed matter opens up a conversation of multi-layered colonial history of the place. Curtain one, the curtain in the hotel window room is a border between semi-private place and unknown city, a border between outsider and the life of unknown location. The second one, theater curtain captured from backstage, reveals traces of performers on the stage and acts as a threshold between performance and reality, presence and absence, secret and disclosed. In the recent project, Spaces and Moments, solo exhibition at Keiko Yamamoto Rosha in London, I pose a research question. How does the trauma of loss pass from one generation to another, translate the structure, the architecture and absent buildings within a city? Can void be filled visually and orally by family memories of contemporary cultural activists or is it the stranger who through aimless wandering reactivates the lost ritual and ceremonies of every day? My aim was to trigger audiences to reflect and listen to their own memories of place, perhaps asking questions about their own unexplained relationships to the cities they think they know well and they lived in all their lives or those places that they are drawn to without knowing really why. During my research trip to Łódź, Polish city, where one third of the population were Jewish before Second World War, I visited the Jewish cemetery on the edge of the city. The place was eerie. There was an extraordinary feeling of presence and absence, which originally I set off to capture in the city itself. This feeling of void is familiar to us all. I decided that the building itself could be a metaphor for the city, conveying the void so deeply felt within the city palimpsest. My hand printed images represent rooms where rituals of parting and death once took place. The image of cemetery with the soundscape of birdsong and traffic noise illustrate how an important layer of the cultural fabric was torn from the landscape, never to be replaced or mended. 
Prancing drawings of houses and synagogue hanged floor to ceiling. Moving images projected onto, uh, onto them shown in their place, I found empty space. This layering of the city unresolved present upon its past reminds us of the willful destruction of a vibrant community and at the heart of an industrial city. The process of mourning is difficult and I'm not sure if the city has actually dealt with it. There's a sense of things being postponed and unresolved. Memories which are not addressed are more felt. In conclusion, um, Marin Hirsch's description of the concept of post-memory, a memory of trauma is passed from one generation to, to the next, but also Ernest van Alphen says, that part of post memory is not remembering and the guilt of lack of remembering. As a final slide, I just would like to play uh, the actual documentation of that final show, which sort of uh, came from um, the original print.
Excellent. That was really great to see how your larger body of work relates to the print. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, so the students have submitted over 25 questions, which is a little more than we could fit in uh, the 10 to 15 minute question period. So what I've done is I I have selected uh, at least one question per artist, and then if there's time for more, we will take a couple of questions from the guest. So the very first question that was submitted by a student is, does the Created and Contested Territories Research Group have any other projects like Territory, the Exhibition in a Box, planned for the near future? Thank you so much. Um, the Territory in the Box will go to Romania, to the prison museum you, you've seen in, in, talked about in my presentation. Um, there is a conference taking place in, August, in April contested that creative conflict in theory and practice. And uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is this possibility with ha uh, having more artists invited to the territory in the box and taking to other places. Uh, a place we would like to go will be to the Decon Decontamination Center for Art in Belgrade in Serbia. So that is uh, one of the um, uh, places we would like to go with the uh, territory in the box. Also, I, we, we've talked quite a bit in our group about uh, another format. So we were thinking if, you know, it, it, there's still plenty of scope for territory to be shown. And as, uh, as, as Uliana said, said that there are more seminars and discussions, but we, we've talked about a palette. We like the idea of a palette as, a, as something that, uh, that materials goods or, or kind of products can, can be placed on and can be, um, can be posted and, and, and mailed and shipped. So uh, it's, I, it's not gone any further than our discussion as a group, um, but we just did like the idea of a palette. Wonderful, thanks very much. Um, Yolena asks Neil, what was your process for making the Irish lump of peace? Well, it's actually, uh, if you think back to going to primary school, your first school, uh, it's actually a potato print. And it is a print, a potato print of a potato plant. Everyone's different. It's actually a hand carved potato. Uh, but essentially, it's about the what, what is known sometimes as the Irish potato famine. Um, it's actually recognised by Canada as one of the early genocides of the of the nineteenth uh, to twentieth centuries. Uh, and my wife, being Irish, and um, I being English have, have that kind of legacy sense of guilt in that over a million Irish people died in the, um, in the famine or the great hunger as it's called. The truth was that actually food was plentiful in Ireland at that time, but it was the very punitive legislation, the penal laws that weren't actually repealed, I think until the 1840s that prevented Irish people from owning land, animals, property, uh, or anything else, they couldn't actually grow their own food. They could grow food on on other people's land for exports. So the, that's that's what's behind it. But essentially, it's a kind of play, and I like the idea of making a potato out of potato print, really. So it, it's a combination of being very uh, simplistic in a material sense, uh, and there's a kind of um, material visual play on words about potatoes and potatoes but also the title Irish Lumper was the name of the predominant species of potato, but there is this kind of stereotypical view of the Irish, certainly in parts of the UK historically, as being uh, not intelligent. And so the notion of lumper is quite a, uh, a kind of lumpy onomatopoeic word as well. So it's got a few levels and the narrative is quite straightforward about the, the million people who died and the, the four million, it's estimated that went to the United States as the diaspora of that uh, uh, traumatic period in Irish history. Okay, um, and th this kind of relates to Elizabeth's question. She was asking why you decided to paint the potatoes in color and then use black and white throughout the rest of the plant. Uh, they're not painted, they're actually, uh, uh, it's printing ink on a potato, which is pressed onto the, the print. So everyone is different, uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, I, I suppose you could post rationalize it, but actually at the time it seemed like it needed a bit of color. So it was a slightly aesthetic decision. But there was something quite pleasurable about mixing the, um, the, the, the paint, the print, ink, printing ink to get it to be as near as the potato I was, I was looking at at the time. Um, so it was just quite a kind of, you know, shaping the potatoes, inking them up and pressing them on. So they're, they're all different. And 
yeah, it was in some way made the potato more um, real in a funny sort of way. Great. Really interesting. All right, we've got a question uh, for you, Liana. Elizabeth asks, what is the meaning behind every other barbed wire being blurred? Uh, that is quite interesting because in fact, it's the shadow. So it's um, 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 barbed wire is used for the, uh, as a, a visual uh, graphic for the, for the motto of the institution. And what is interesting, normally when you have it on fortification or defensive or, or uh, warning, no, don't cross there, it is against the, the sky. So it doesn't have a kind of surface to be reflected on or to be projected. But that for the sake of uh, the symmetry, I, uh, uh, I thought that the barbed wire is projected against you know, uh, a wall which uh, very easily um, can be rationalized uh, as for confinement, coercion, control of the body, um, and, and to a certain extent injustice. So uh, the imaginary wall in the poster is that which prompted the, the shadow kind of, uh, of the wire, barbed wire. Uh, we've got another design related question um, for Carl. Melina asks, what is your perspective on the significance of the text in your artwork? Well, hopefully in, in the, the, the talk that I gave where I kind of showed some of the other words that I played around with, uh, it, it's really significant. Um, but there is that kind of nice sort of disjuncture between the image and the text. And, you know, and this, uh, I suppose, it, it, in a contemporary sense, this has its origins in concrete poetry, uh, or you could think of conceptual works, Lawrence Viner using words that then generate an image of uh, uh, an image in the mind, so that um, so that we can complete the artwork in our imagination. Um, but actually, I was thinking about this, and I'm thinking that it goes back further than that. I, I, I'm quite fascinated by the way words and images were combined in medieval art, um, particularly kind of uh, illuminated capitals in uh, in, in manuscripts. And but also, uh, I was mindful of something that I saw many years ago uh, at the Burrow Collection in Glasgow, uh, which was a piece of medieval stained glass. Uh, that curiously enough was about Islet, it, which is kind of uh, in, in just on the uh, the west to the west of London. Uh, but the eye of slip was an actual eye in the stained glass. So it was um, it, it, the the image itself had to create it, the, the word. So um, I've just always liked a play on words and the interrelationship between images and words and uh, how nothing is immutable. Uh, so Travis and Elizabeth both noted the low contrast used in Desmond's Doggerland piece and they ask if there's a reason for that low contrast. It's a good question. Um, well yeah uh, oh yes that, thank you very much. Who's holding that up? Is that you Neil? Thank you. Yeah <laughs> thank you very, that's what you could have seen. Um, yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is deliberately. Um, I'm, I was. I mean, it, it was. Yeah, deliberate. Very deliberate. Um, f first and foremost, the two, the two uh, tones. The two two tones are two types of field grey. So the colours are called field grey or feldgrau in German, and the the Doggerland itself is spelt and and coloured, filled in with uh, the Wehrmacht field grey that was worn by soldiers in the Second World War, German soldiers in the Second World War, but the surrounding ground is uh, the contemporary field grey that's worn by the Bundeswehr, the, the contemporary German army. So, so firstly, it was sort of, it, it, but it, as it happened, the, you know, what was pleasing to see for me was the, the way that it was kind of camouflaged a little bit. It, 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 it kind of grows out of the, the, the more one looks at it, hopefully the more it starts to kind of become pronounced. Yes, and the further back you get, the less so. Um, but I was playing with camouflage, yeah, playing with ideas of camouflage for, for, for in that piece and, uh, and how it kind of recedes and accedes. It went through a number of different permutations of, I flipped it round and, uh, and there were there a baffling amount of field greys that were available to me. Um, but I went for the kind of, the, that particular field grey in the, the Doggerland is used with was the, 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 the last type of field grey worn by the Wehrmacht. So that's why. <laughs> right. Uh, Walker asked Megda, uh, does the red smudge represent blood? Um, no, <laughs> no, it's, um, I've, uh, when I was in Wuchi, I spent quite a bit of time at, um, um, in the city archive where I looked at plans from, um, you know, city plans from, 
um, beginning of uh, 20th century, uh, plans of for planning permissions for the buildings where most of uh, 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 synagogues and other buildings connected to Jewish cultures were uh, drawn. And um, so I photographed a lot of them and probably the red part, I mean, it, it's uh, my painting of the plan, which had the, maybe um, uh, the red uh, uh, footprint of the building. Um, sometimes also maybe in one of the images could be, um, because the projection of the uh, film, which is um, made in the sites where the buildings were and they're not there anymore, um, and also there is a little bit of film um, captured from actual tram as well going through, you know, through the city. Uh, there is quite a lot of graffitis as well in, in, in watch on the walls. So um, when the image sort of smears over, over the, the drawings of the plans and so on, um, sometimes the graffiti blends with the uh, drawings of the plants as well. So some red will be in the film and some is actually in, in, in the print or drawings and paintings. Um, so I have a question. Um, what exactly about Texas interests the created and contested territories research group regarding to territory? I, I, I suppose I'd, I'd jump in there just that it, it was our, um, it's our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Nick Maffey, um, who's from Texas uh, and um, uh, and was you know generous enough to write a, a, a fabulous essay to bind the whole uh, territory box together. So when we were when we were going out in radio routes to try to think of locations um, that would be kind of worldwide to be able to show the portfolio, uh, it was Nick's kind of you know coming forward and suggesting a few locations in Texas. We didn't have a bit of a Second World War theme going on, don't we? But also, in, I live just near, uh, when I'm in the UK, an Air Force base in Coltshall. And actually, I was part of a project with, I think it was the 8th, is it the 8th USAF, um, who were based in Norfolk. And I actually met some of the airmen who were based in Norfolk in the Second World War. Uh, so there's, a, there's actually quite a strong connection. And the last um, uh, celebratory meeting of those veterans in the UK I think we filmed with students going back to about 2010 and that was the last event um, but you know there is a very strong connection in this region with the United States Air Force and there still are United States Air Force bases here. Yeah I, can I just follow that up uh, with what one has just said there in fact Norwich the city of Norwich has actually got um, 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 a designated monument in the library in the city, which is the um, the United the, the Eighth Air Force has got its own museum uh, couched in the in the in the city, and uh, it's a research library, and it's run by um, I, I can't remember which university American university runs it, but um, the personnel there are American who 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 um, look after the library, and it's an incredible resource um, of uh, for everything from records of of um, personnel serving to uh, to all sorts of um, family histories. It's, it's a really interesting resource. And if anyone ever comes to Norwich to have a look at it, uh, I really rec or comes to Norwich, I recommend you you visit it. It's, it's really a really interesting place. Yeah, it's the Second Air Division Memorial Library. Um, now, Walker, um, Walker, do you have a question that you implied in the chat? Sure. Um, one of the I have a question specifically. It was specifically directed at Professor Rowe, but it can be kind of open to anyone. And um, one thing that kind of um, Sorry, I have it written down. Um, I know you talked about how your father would collect um, shrapnel and sort of kind of take that interest in kind of the the artifacts of weaponry and war. And but after he had an incident with a, a bomb, you said his bicycle was bombed. Mm -hmm. um, he he dropped that fascination, and I was just wondering if you wanted to talk on kind of the nature of people's fascination with weaponry, kind of weaponry, weaponry war and sort of how that ties to using an insecticide, a really destructive insecticide to get rid of the Colorado beetle. 
Mm. Uh, it's, I mean, the whole story is quite a quite a complex one. I mean, uh, the, the the context of my father was that you know he was a he was a v v very young teenager during the Second World War, and I think it was quite common uh, for kids uh, to just go out and pick up bits of shrapnel and bullet casings and things, bits of old aircraft. Um, uh, so you know, it, it, it was it was it was a hobby, believe it or not. In the midst of of war, it was a hobby, um, as was collecting birds' eggs and insects. You know, hor terrible things. Kind of a late Victorian notion of collecting uh, natural history and killing it to uh, to to kind of index it. Um, uh, so it was quite a common thing. I don't think that he had a morbid fascination for war, but certainly when he was blown off his bicycle and actually he saw somebody killed in front of him, um, and he was blown off his bike, but uh, the person in front of him was killed by the bomb. Um, and um, he had an immediate repulsion. I mean, he actually went home and got rid of his collection. He couldn't face it. And then actually found enormous solace in natural history. I don't think he, I don't think he carried on killing things, thankfully. Um, but right up until the time when he died, only a couple of years ago, it, natural history was was a great kind of sense of well-being for him. I have a question for the whole collective, um, for the research group. So um, I don't know, in the, in the States, in academia, I think the visual arts have kind of a, a confusing relationship with the term research. And so there's a lot of kind of... Um, I don't know, I, I'm a visual artist and I'm also a creative researcher, but I'm just fascinated as to how your group came to be. What was the impetus? And I'm sorry if I missed it, if that was mentioned, but like how, how did it um, come to be that you would embark on this? Um, you know, it is like, I loved your reference to herding cats because I've been part of these larger groups before and they are, um, they do present quite a few challenges and I'm so I'm, I'm really um, inspired and I admire the process and the way that you've documented it and presented it to us. Um, but I'm just curious as to how it came to be. I think there are, there are two drivers for it. One is that I think we're very fortunate, um, certainly when I was at university as I left very recently, in having a very interesting set of people and not being too large an institution. I mean, there are only, I think, 160 academic staff in the university. Um, and it's a very conversational community. So I think that there was a sense that we always wanted to, to work together in different constituencies, but it was finding the time. And the only way we'd find the time is to find the motivation and impetus to do that. The, in, in the UK, we have um, a research assessment every, well, four or five years, depending on COVID, six, six years. Uh, and uh, we were at the point in the university of discussing a new strategy for research which went out to consultation as part of that consultation we identified three different themes and one of which was con created in contested territories uh, the others are pattern and chaos and human interfaces and so people then uh, gravitated not everybody gravitated towards these themes and it just so happened that that was our group of people and it was a particularly diverse group of people but also I think unusual in the fact that it's quite an outward looking group there are people external people as part of that and uh, we very much wanted it not to be just a local in-house group but to, and I think it's true to say we're the only group with an international reach and that was part of you know one not wanting to be parochial and I think the other thing to say is that the to have some rigor to the research and not just to say, oh, let's make an exhibition where we can all put our individual work in and then try and hang it in some loose way on a, um, a title, you know, as a kind of group show, which, you know, has been done to death. And then you try and, you know, post hoc rationalize it into some sensible curatorial theme. Uh, I've been guilty of that in the past as well. Um, was not the way forward. We had to get it right at the start. And so the only way to do that was to thrash out the different kinds of practice, the different formats, the different kind of vehicles we want to use. Now, there is a sense in the group as well that sustainability is important. It's a bit like you know, touring exhibitions. Uh, you know, I was part of the British Art Show. Um, uh, um, kind of these juggernaut things that are environmentally terribly unfriendly. If you look at the Venice Biennale, you know, work transported everywhere, art fairs. And so the idea that we could make something fairly compact as well that came out of this, but it was really a, a desire to, to be friendly and work together. Although we have to say there were fallings out uh, between some of the members at times, which we had to moderate uh, and kind of uh, build bridges. And that's why I'm an ambassador now for a different place, but um, maybe that's it in a nutshell. 
can I just follow up uh, uh, Neil's question? So I, I think it was really, really important to embrace a research question. I think that was uh, very important to establish at the very beginning uh, because we are coming from, from different uh, areas, but also we had different research experiences. Um, uh, although I'm trained as an architect and fine artist, my, my, my PhD was in, in art history, dealing with uh, uh, late antiquity architecture, and for that I had to, in, to become a kind of a classicist to, to acquire a language to deal with the text, uh, because it was very much focused on the procession of architecture in, in sixth century. And when I joined the Norwich University of the Arts, um, it was very obvious for me that created and contested territory was the right house the, uh, for me to, to, to grow or to dwell. And easily I could shift my, my research from sixth century perception of, uh, of uh, late antiquity architecture, sacred architecture in Byzantium to see, to work with the same buildings, but to approach them from a kind of contested territories as for spaces. So, um, um, and, um, and my contribution, for instance, to the contested uh, 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 VAT uh, conference will be to look at the sixth century Hagia, so Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul as a, as a contested site throughout history. And again, I, I try to push myself because it's very easy to, to engage with the ideology, with uh, concepts of uh, political commodity and so on. But I, I push myself to go one step for, uh, forward and to try to make some collages around Hagia Sophia, which represents different mo modes or moments of contestation throughout history. And contestation even understood as contest, are contest that there is an architectural kind of com competition as the starting point for the building. So uh, when I was doing my research on Byzantine architecture, it never crossed my mind that I can uh, wear my artist hat once again uh, and to, to have this uh, bridge between the ivory tower and the uh, research-based uh, research. I, I just wanted to add one tiny other little thing as well, and I'm pointing over there, but of course Magda might not be over there on your screen. But I was just going to say that, you know, some, something else, we, you know, we've got a number of guest, guests that aren't NUA staff uh, in this project, um, and that's happened because we found these people largely through uh, academic fora. So, you know, I've met Magda at printmaking conferences, and that's how I know Magda, uh, and, and, uh, and knew that, she, that with her interest in uh, in um, kind of field recording and, and space and, and urban spaces would be probably ideal for this project. So in, in, in terms, Courtney, of, of you know, academia and, re and research and also being an artist, you know, sometimes there are those really nice networks that kind of happen and bring about unexpected things as well. Wonderful. So um, just to respect everyone's time, I think you know, at this time, I have to thank all the students for submitting their really great questions. We just have so many of them. Um, and on behalf of the curatorial committee, which includes Chair Dr. Cecilia Giusti, Dr. Stephen Caffey, who's with us today, Professor Krista Steinke Finch, Professor Felice House, and Professor Emeritus Karen Hillier. I would like to thank the Created and Contested Research Group for sharing their curatorial project with the Wright Gallery. Curatorial Exhibition in a Box is on view at the Wright Gallery through March 11th, 2021. The gallery hours are weekdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And please note that face coverings and social distancing are required, and there is a maximum of 10 visitors allowed in the gallery at once.